make a change in your communities. Across Aboriginal Australia, the Black Lives Matter movement, born on the streets of America, resonates deeply. Whose lives matter? Black lives matter! Whose lives matter? Black lives matter! Indigenous leaders are using the groundswell of anger over racial injustice to protest the high number of their own people who live and die in Australian jails. Aboriginal people are disproportionately arrested and locked up in Australia, some as young as 10 years old. Being escorted from the courthouse back there when it's just all metal around you, you just feel like you're a caged animal. Just things like that that no child should ever go through. Locking up 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds is not the answer. We've got to do things better. 101 East meets former inmates and those on the front lines of the criminal justice system in Western Australia, the state with the country's highest rate of Aboriginal incarceration. In the town of Fremantle, a 19-year-old makes his final journey to the local cemetery. He's one of four Indigenous prisoners to die inside a Western Australian jail in 2020. Stanley's suspected suicide is a death in custody, a term used to describe any fatality involving the authorities. The system failed. The system failed him. He was still a young, young boy. He should not have been in that prison. He should have been out here where the family could have loved him and this could have happened, wouldn't have happened. Prisoners on day release have come to pay their last respects. This outpouring of sorrow is all too common for many Indigenous families in the era of mass incarceration. Since the early 90s, there have been more than 440 Indigenous deaths in custody, the majority in Western Australia. When is it going to stop? I just lost my son last year. When are they going to stop killing our kids? We want them to come home. Stanley was serving a two-year sentence at a medium security jail for a string of burglary-related offences. With parole, the young inmate could have been released in six months. He'd also spent time in youth detention, where he learned to paint, a pastime that helped him deal with anxiety and depression. Stanley's sisters, Tiana and Jacinta, remember him as a shy but loving member of the family. To lose a brother like Stan, he's just unreal. He was my little shadow. I wanted him to grow old with me. But he'll be forever young in the house. But he was so loving to my kids. Like, he sent my son a birthday card on his 13th birthday. That was in April. Um, did a painting of his hand for my daughter. <laughs> sent it to her for her birthday. My brother wasn't no big bad prisoner. No. You know, he wasn't a bad person. They didn't deserve to be neglected. <laughs> they didn't deserve that. Jacinta says she warned prison officers that her brother was struggling in jail, but requests to move him to another section where he had older family members were refused. Instead, Stanley was temporarily placed in a crisis care unit for at-risk inmates. My brother showed physical warning signs. Um, he had cuts on his arms. He had cuts on his chest. 
he wasn't coping. He wasn't mentally coping. So him being in a state where he wasn't coping and he wasn't feeling loved just pl constantly plays in my mind. Just constantly. My brother's mental state. Within 72 hours of returning to the general jail population, Stanley was found unconscious in a storeroom. They were notified that he was suicidal, but he wasn't accounted for for two, two hours, hours. Until they did muster. You know, and even <coughs> then, it wasn't even Scrooge that found him. It was his fellow inmates. Yes. It was his friends. It was his brothers. They neglected him. They had a duty of care. To he him. died two days later in hospital. Now we have to suffer. His family is suffering. Like I get so angry, really, really angry because he felt so alone in those in those moments. And we always and I always said to him, bro, when you can't when you're feeling stressed and when you're feeling like you can't cope, go and paint. So when I when I when we had to hold his hand in a hospital, he had paint under his nails. Mm. So he tried to cope, but he was not supported in the environment that he was in. The alleged neglect torments his mother, Connie. He was in a unit for prisoners who were 18 years old up to 25 years old. In jail, there's cameras, security all around. How was he, my, my baby, found in a, in a storeroom? And that's where he, it happened. How did he get access to a storeroom? How can anyone get access, a prisoner in jail, get access to a storeroom? The state coroner will investigate Stanley's death. What answers are you guys searching for? Oh, the truth. We want the truth. Anyone that's lost a, lost a loved one in, a, in any prison system has a lot of questions and they want to understand how that system works. Um, and I think asking those questions are legitimate. Corrective Services Commissioner Tony Hassel manages Western Australia's 17 prisons and youth detention centre. Every death in any prison is a, you know, a failure in a sense because we have to look after people. And we make the system as safe as we possibly can. But sometimes, um, you know, if somebody's very, very determined, um, they will actually take their, their own life. Um, and that's incredibly sad, you know, and everybody wants to understand why that happens. In response to the deaths, he now leads a task force that aims to prevent suicide in jails. I want the task force to make our system as safe and humane as possible and to look at those things that we can do to ensure that. So we have the rules and procedures is just one component. Taking away um, points where people may hang themselves is another um, thing that we'll absolutely look at. Are we locking up people who actually need better social support, not mm. being locked away mm. for long periods of time? Well, I think that's a really good question. There's probably about 800 prisoners in the state system at the moment with a diagnosed mental health problem. And some of those prisoners should be in, a, in a, a mental health facility, you know, shouldn't shy away from the fact but we haven't got that option at the moment. While policy changes won't bring Stanley back, his mother wants better medical treatment and mental health support in jails. I just worry about those young boys. You know, um, I really worry for their mental state. I mean, what? What, what are they thinking what their future's going to be like, you know? In a final message to the prisoners, both those at the funeral and those watching by video link from inside jail, the pastor echoes Connie's fears. I want to just tell you one thing. Your life is valuable. Your life is at the utmost importance. Your life means more than your reputation. It does. Your life is valuable. Very, very, very valuable. 
Have the best life you can have to honor your brother. And don't waste it. You only get one go at this. It was a preventable death. We weren't put on this earth to bury our children, but we too often do. Jerry Georgiatos has been a friend of the family since Stanley was a child. He and Megan Krakoa provide support to Western Australians affected by deaths in custody. This is becoming too normalised for our community. A death in custody should never be normalised. The ripple effect is one of hurt, one of pain, one of suffering, and particularly when there has been a death and there's no, no answers as to what happened. That creates a lot of unaddressed trauma in our community. It's something they see every day in their work with the National Suicide Prevention and Trauma Recovery Project. They said that he had suicided, like hung himself, and I didn't believe that because he, he was getting out in two days, he was only on Rima, and it was only breach of restraining order. Megan says coronial investigations into a death in custody can be a long, arduous journey offering little resolution. One, two, three, go, go, go. No prison guard or police officer has ever been convicted over an Indigenous death in custody in Australia. That is not right. That is not fair. That is not justice. You need to know what's going on with your loved one. What were his last days like? What were his last moments like? Was there some other act of another that caused the death of their loved ones? Every week, Megan and Jerry give psychosocial support to families caught up in the state's criminal justice system. They say it's a form of assistance missing in Western Australia's jails. Um, so what we need to do is get the statement from your boy. Yeah, he can do that. I know it's really hard and things like that, but we need that to progress. Mm -hmm. How's the kids with uh, dad now uh, going? They have their days. Three out of four people living below the poverty line Descendants of the First Peoples have been to jail, have been to jail and are likely to go again unless we actually support them in the ways that we have to. The reality is that their issues are so deep, their issues are so damaging, so hurtful, so toxic, so alone, that they need support, they need to be validated. And unless we go to them, unless we work with them, they've got next to little hope. Across town, Montana Kelly, a grandmother who has struggled with homelessness for years, just wants a shoulder to cry on. Her son Charlie committed suicide, and her other two sons are in jail. We went to the cemetery yesterday, picked my nephew up from prison, sat at the cemetery for an hour. Mm. How'd that go? It's hard. It's so hard. So I have to leave my boy all the time. I just wish I could have my son, but I can't. It was so sad, my son. It was just so sad. And he was scared he was going to go to jail. And, yeah, I miss my boy so much. How old was little man? He just turned 18. 18 in, yeah, 18 in July he turned. Charlie was living on the streets and took his own life after his lawyer told him he was likely to go to jail for four years for committing an assault. It's been 10 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes before he'd done it. He came in there, he leant over and kissed me. He said, Mama, I love you. I didn't think nothing. It was hard as a mother seeing my son now. And I was just screaming, Charlie, just please open your eyes, Charlie, please. Oh, my 
It's hard, my son. I tried to get help from him. I tried and I tried and I couldn't get nothing from my son. I just want my son back, but I'll never get my son back. My son, please get my son back, Daddy. Please, I want my son. It's incredibly difficult. I mean, it's very emotional. But one thing is that you need to have a heart, you need to have compassion, you need to show empathy, you need to turn up, you need to be there for the families. If you don't truly understand, appreciate, respect, the struggles of our people, the plight of our, of our Aboriginal nation. How can you put in place workable strategies? Of course there's anger, of course there's frustrations. Because we have, since colonisation, and like going to 2020 today, we're still being left behind. Aboriginal criminal justice researcher, Hannah McGlade, says the pathway from poverty to prison that confronts Indigenous Australia dates back to the mid-1800s. The Aboriginal people were, from the point of contact with the colonists, were subjected to very cruel incarceration. Men from all around the state were rounded up whenever they resisted, say, laws around um, servitude or slavery. Today, Indigenous incarceration rates continue to increase. Between 2004 and 2014, the number of Aboriginal prisoners nationally rose by 88%. I accept that there are too many Aboriginal people um, in prison. I think we have to own that. But it's an incredibly complex problem to resolve. Is the system racist? I, I don't think so. I think what we're dealing with is, as I've said, a group of people emerging from colonisation. And we have to be honest about that and accept that. Aboriginal people make up just 4% of Western Australia's population, but account for 39% of adult prisoners. Experts blame the state's mandatory sentencing laws, which impose minimum prison terms, and don't allow judges' discretion to look at offenders' circumstances. Western Australia is the mother of all jailers. I see people going into prisons, people coming out, the same people going in, out, in, out. When does the cycle stop? For decades, Indigenous Australians have taken to the streets, protesting discrimination in the criminal justice system with little success. But in 2020, when police brutality and Black Lives Matter rallies erupted in the US, it also reignited protests across Australia. People are really um, very angry that Aboriginal people are still dying in custody and that racism and racist violence is still a big issue here, that people are losing their lives. I think Black Lives Matter has been a wake-up call to the uh, Western or white institutions to say, we're taking this very seriously and you need to too. Raising the age of criminal responsibility has also emerged as one of the lightning rod issues of Australia's protest movement. Aboriginal children as young as 10 years old can be detained. This is one of the lowest ages of criminal responsibility in the world and a number of UN bodies have come down very hard on Australia and told them that 14 is the minimum age of criminal responsibility. They're simply not listening. This 13-year-old boy, who we'll call Adam, has already been to Western Australia's only youth prison, Banksia Hill Detention Centre. When I first went there, I tried to act tough, because I thought like it was like real jail, like proper men's jail. He was first incarcerated last year and has already served 12 short sentences for petty offences. You hear keys all the time. All you hear is keys and doors opening, doors shutting so you can like basically hear at night and through the day. See so keys, keys and keys just shaking and shaking. 
tickets for your head. You said some of the kids were like 10 and 11 and you were 12. Uh, were all the kids treated fairly in there? No, not really. What things did you see that you think a kid shouldn't be subjected to? Like 10 year olds getting bashed from like 16 year olds. Yeah, that's like weird. You saw that happen? Yeah. If you act like, you're trying to act like a big rough person and you think you can stand over everyone, you're going to get bashed or mobbed in there. But if you act like just a quiet person, you don't do nothing, yeah, just you won't get picked on nothing, just leave you alone. Adam grew up in a country town in the care of his grandmother. His parents were heavy drug users who both killed themselves by the time he was 10. Soon after, Adam began smoking marijuana and sniffing petrol. Why did you take drugs from such a young age? I don't know, because like everyone was saying my mum and dad, they died from taking drugs. So I just thought, well, if they died from taking drugs, and I'm never going to see him again. So why don't I just like, you know, just take drugs, see if I'll die. This pain led him to spiral out of control, down a path of homelessness and petty theft. It was with my mates, just mates, no family, just mate. I was hungry. Yeah, my nan, she didn't like, let me back to her house, kept telling me to just go. So yeah, I'll just do what my mates are doing to get feed. Yeah, started stealing. Just like stole cars and broke into houses. Since being released from youth detention, Adam has returned to school and authorities placed him in the custody of his 18-year-old brother, who we'll call Michael. Estranged for much of their childhoods, both boys have spent most of their lives in Banksia Hill or on the streets. I had nothing. Been down to that point where I had to like steal off a homeless person myself. I was homeless, I was stealing off other homeless people. Just for like whatever was in their bag. I got I got myself locked up. I just went and like smashed the window and then sat and waited for the police to come. I got locked up so I could go get a bed and feed. Cause yeah, it was pretty cold out in the city. So in in a weird way, Banksia was a place in some ways of safety because you had sometimes, nothing. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes when you, there's nothing and you got nothing, it was like, I go there for feet. I deliberately get myself arrested just so I can go and eat and have a shower, get like proper socks because my feet was hurting in the same socks for a while. Michael was 14 when he first entered Banksy Hill Detention Centre. Does it teach anyone a lesson? No, it doesn't really help. It just puts you behind and then they just expect you to sit there till the time's up and then you come out and you're supposed to be a better person. But it's not like that, that's like, yeah, it's just bad. They've got to know where people are coming from, what they're doing it for, but they don't do that. They just see that you've done wrong, they just chuck you in banks, yeah. You messed up, you go behind bars. If you want parry, we got whole boxes of it or whatever. Jerry and Megan are trying to help the boys find their feet, providing them with food and housing. They say their story shows how the system is failing young Indigenous inmates. What have been their crimes? Homelessness. They've lost their parents, they're orphans. So now we're jailing children who are orphans, who are homeless and who are stealing to survive, with nowhere to go. Where is child protection for them? Where is the system there for them? Where is our government there for them? What court could think in its right mind that it should be jailing 12 and 13 and 14 year olds? What were their crimes? For now, the hope is that the boys are getting their lives back on track. Michael dreams of one day becoming a mechanic, but right now his hands are full, just looking after Adam. I'm still trying to figure out how to look after myself properly and like my mental health. And I've got to try to do that with my little brother as well. And it's like, I've got to try to get myself into stuff and do stuff good with myself, like, as well as do it with him. What do you think of this, this life? I hate it. 
hide it. I actually didn't go back, just around age eight or something, just start again from there. But just, nah, it's not a good life to live. Michael, Adam and other Indigenous children who end up in youth detention mostly come from the remote corners of Western Australia. Like the Kimberley, a wild, rugged region in the state's far north. So this country up here is owned by the Aboriginal people, the first people um, who walked this land. They're an extraordinary group of people, um, but they do struggle. They do struggle. It's just a big, long, hard blunder, that, thanks. Since the 1980s, Senior Sergeant Neville Rip has worked in outback towns across the Kimberley region. How's everyone? The Kimberleys, for a police officer working up here, is exhausting. Some of our beats up here for a small police station, you know, can be the size of um, France. That's a big beat. and. Um, you know, we sort of live out of the car. His first police posting was in Fitzroy Crossing, an inland town on the banks of a sprawling river. Now, more than 35 years on, he's back to tackle a growing youth crime wave, including kids stealing cars. There might be up to seven or eight juveniles in that stolen car. And that vehicle then rolling over and children as young as 10 in that vehicle with no seatbelt or restraint on them. And that's scary. The senior sergeant always fears the next crash could be fatal. Hi, Dylan. Sharing his concerns is Dylan Andrews, an Indigenous elder whose young relatives were involved in recent car thefts. I've talked with a couple of the young fellas. I really, after that accident they had, really concerned with that. And I'm yeah. telling them, your life is so precious. Yeah. yeah. And once you're gone, you're gone. Yeah. These kids, they think they're bulletproof. You know, they think it's fun to go in the stolen car. He also doesn't want them to start a cycle of imprisonment. You know, there's so many family that it, it, it affects. Yeah, we have to get more things happening here in, 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 in town. Mm. Some activity for them, like, yeah. you know. But Senior Sergeant Rip thinks activities can only do so much to reduce incarceration rates. For him, the key is to recruit the next generation of Indigenous kids into the police force. He mentors Aboriginal police cadets who live in nearby communities, like Daniel Carrington. They can smooth over a situation a lot faster than we can. They're dealing with their own people, they're policing their own people. And it's a win-win situation. Daniel's learning our business as police officers and we're learning about culture and how to deal with Aboriginal youth at the same time. How good is that? Daniel, have you got a minute please mate? So we've got the offences on the assault and the, the trespass and we've got the victims on there and the suspect. So. Daniel's only just started training and has a lot to learn. But he says his biggest challenges are closer to home. It was a bit hard at first. Like people didn't trust me as much. All my friends, my family, close relatives. It took them probably about two, three months till they like warmed up to me. Till they realized that I'm, I'm still the same person, just in a blue uniform. Daniel was inspired to become a cadet after seeing two Aboriginal police officers run sports clinics in his community. Well, I didn't know that there was Aboriginal cops, so it was sort of a little wake-up moment. I was a bit terrified of the police when I was a kid. Growing up, um, yeah, I've seen, I've seen everything. Um, I've, seen, I've seen people died, I've seen people drunk on drugs and all that. Little kids now, they're all growing up and thinking that's like normal stuff. That's what we're going to do when we grow up. 
Back at the station, Senior Sergeant Rip shows me newly built cells where offenders are held. The bars on the windows have been replaced with high strength glass to make detainees feel less trapped. So if an offender is a child, um, what extra provisions are put in place to ensure that um, there is a duty of care? Yeah, look, a, a big list of things, but first and foremost, uh, that their parents know where they are. Um, we'll actually bring parents in for them. Um, we will try and get them out on their own bail under their parents. But unfortunately, if they've committed some crime um, and they haven't got those carers out there with them, maybe this is the best place for them, for their safety for the night. Senior Sergeant Rip says out here, the last thing police want is to fly children three hours away to Western Australia's only youth detention centre, Banksia Hill. To watch a young Kimberley boy who's never been out of the Kimberley, never been on an aeroplane, um, to see him leave his family and, and the tears from the, the parents, that's hard. Um, some juveniles that have gone down there, they've learnt more about stealing cars from other youths. You know, that's a crying shame. We don't want to have to have any juvenile incarcerated. But if that needs to be done, I'd like to see a, a centre in the Kimberley. The conditions inside youth detention centres across the nation has shocked Australia. Despite international pressure, the Australian government deferred a decision to raise the age of criminal responsibility from 10 to 14. Senior Sergeant Rip believes the laws should change. Should they be incarcerated at 10 years of age? I, I don't think so. I don't think so. In his experience, youth here have a lot to deal with. Many grow up amid substance abuse, domestic violence and social desperation. Attending domestic violence jobs, I've seen kids still playing in the sandpit when dad's attacking mum um, and they're not even affected. It's like as if it's a normal day and you know that's that's terrible. There's one particular incident he'll never forget. Um, four years ago when I worked at a a smaller community. Um, I had a 10-year-old girl that hung herself. Whew. Police are human. We're not meant to see that. We're not meant to be doing CPR, life support on a 10-year-old girl. How does a 10-year-old girl hang herself? How does she have the idea? Her sister did it when she was 14. Sorry. Senior Sergeant Rip believes the authorities have failed Indigenous communities. We lost a generation there somewhere. We weren't doing things that we're doing today, 20 years ago. So if we had juvenile offenders back then, the police weren't working enough with them. And now they've got children, and I think that is suffering there because we miss those people back then. On the streets of Broome, there's no missing the human cost of those failures. The Kalari Patrol steps in to help the drunk and disorderly, who could easily end up in jail without their intervention. The biggest town in the Kimberley, Broome is a drawcard for many Indigenous people from smaller outback communities where alcohol is restricted. Here, it's easy to get.
Tonight, a father with a baby says he can't find his partner. So the Kalari Patrol head to a sports oval where the mum and her family gather to drink and gamble. The team finds the baby's mother and takes her home along with other relatives. But tempers flare on the bus. And as they arrive home, the situation turns violent. The Kulari patrol staff say this is a quiet night. If we didn't exist, the prisons would be sky high. <laughs> um, a lot more incarcerations, um, a lot more domestic violence, a lot more uh, problems in the homes. Cassandra Callum runs the Kalari Patrol. I don't like to see it just as a pickup service. Uh, we, we engage, we connect. Uh, we know uh, clients firsthand. Um, half the time we're related to them. So it's a personal thing as well. Aside from patrols, these government-funded workers help those who are homeless and alcoholics. Today, they've organised a fishing trip to the coast to reconnect elders with the land. It gives them that respect for themselves uh, to know that they're not just looked down as drinkers. It's just a matter of encouraging them to find their feet again. As the elders cook their catch, Cassandra tells them about how they can access legal services and crisis accommodation. If I get you into that accommodation, they will expect you to do a program one day a week at the, maybe at, um, at the Sober Up Shelter. They do it in the mornings for like two, three hours, day program. She says the criminal justice system can trap families in Broome, away from their communities because they need to attend outstanding courts for domestic violence or for some drug alcohol related incident, then they're, they're, they're kept here for longer. Um, and then therefore the children that's with them, they have to stay behind as well. <laughs> In towns across the Kimberley, Indigenous children roam the streets at night, bored and unsupervised. Recent data shows Western Australian Aboriginal children are almost 50 times more likely to go to youth detention than non-Indigenous kids. Cassandra says they commit break-ins and robberies out of desperation and neglect. Other patrols run by Aboriginal corporations focus on getting them off the streets. I use my house as a safe place for children, but um, for seven days I had to go to Perth. I had a particular family that was in town. His parents were intoxicated down on the Oval. I wasn't home. He did seven break-ins in that time, just so he could get money for food. She says the tough law and order approach only entrenches disadvantage and criminal behaviour. I have seen so many kids being sent to Perth where I don't believe that should be the case. They should be somewhere in the Kimberleys where they're not traumatised. Two thousand kilometres away in Perth, Corrective Services Commissioner Tony Hassel shows us where these children end up. Banksia Hill Detention Centre. Banksia Hill covers the whole state of Western Australia, which is two and a half million square kilometres, which is the size of Western Europe, and we have kids from all over the state, and that presents um, challenges for us. How do we look after these kids, making sure that our response in terms of their needs is appropriate? So this is your main sports facility. 65% of youth inmates in Banksia Hill are Indigenous. We can't show their faces, interview prisoners, or film sensitive parts of the detention centre. 
A 2018 study of Banksy Hills youth inmates found almost 90% had severe neurological impairment. In many cases, the result of mothers drinking alcohol during pregnancy. The problems don't end there. A lot of these kids don't go to school. So finding new ways and new opportunities to engage them in learning is a real challenge. Very often we find kids from Aboriginal communities, English isn't their first language. Then you've also got the psychological, mental health issues that we have to deal with. But all of these kids will be learning in one way or another. They just don't know they're learning. See my people sleeping on the street And they look around with no shoes on their feet And they ain't got no clothes, they ain't got no money The government doing nothing, yeah they're acting all funny To make education more appealing, Banksia Hill has even set up a hip hop academy where young detainees compose rap music. Obviously the kids were really motivated to come into this environment and learn because it's something that they're really interested in. But not only are they doing music, but their literacy and numeracy outcomes have improved significantly. But critics say it's not enough, and children identified as misbehaving are being isolated in conditions which international human rights groups call a dangerous form of solitary confinement. We don't have what people would think is solitary confinement, i.e. people locked up for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We don't have that in our system. We do have to, for the safety of individuals and the safety of other people, take people out of then what we would call their mainstream living and put them in an area of the prison that's more regulated and more controlled. Why is jail the only solution for a child as young as 10? Well, I think it's the last resort. People that are here, the young people, and they are young people, but are here primarily for quite dangerous offences, um, and the government has to protect its citizens. Um, no child here is left behind or forgotten. We never write anyone off. Whatever they've done to get in here, however serious their offence is, no one is written off. Hey, but outside the razor wire, former Indigenous inmates say the system failed them. Shania Ma was 15 when she was first locked up in Banksia Hill Detention Centre. When I was in and out of Banksia, they, they did know that I was you know, on drugs and alcohol and my charges were pretty serious, but they never really got me that help that I needed when I got released and back into the community. And that's why I'd ended up in um, adult prisons too. I did not even do one counselling session in Banksia. I didn't, well, I should have. The only persons who came out there to see me would be detectives about like other charges. And that was it. Shania and her two younger sisters had a tough upbringing. She mm. says they were removed from their mother by child protection officials when she was just nine. I felt like I was betrayed by my mum, by everybody around me. It took a big toll on me because like, I had to look out for my two little sisters, so I had to grow up pretty fast myself. Never really had a normal childhood when I had to look out for them all the time. And um, it made me, like, age and mature way beyond my years, which sometimes I look back at it like, I just wish I just enjoyed one day playing as a kid. Shania and her sisters were then split up and put in a series of foster homes across Western Australia. It was not nice, like, to be in and out of 50 different homes, even more, uh, you know, just being tossed around. You do feel like, you know, nobody loves you, nobody cares. So um, we was talking to caseworkers. We wanted to be reunited again. Um, what they organised was school holidays to go see my sisters, um, but that wasn't enough because I, I still feel empty inside, broken. You used the word empty just then. Yep. What were you missing? Um, just the little things, um, what people take for granted, like a hug, a kiss. Just the little things that people take for granted. When Shania turned 14, she began heavily drinking alcohol and using methamphetamines. I started using the substances because, you know, I really thought it was healing me, but it really wasn't healing me. I didn't realise just everything that I'd been through. I, I couldn't handle it. Um, I exploded and I went blank, and I don't want to ever, ever go through that ever again. She was repeatedly locked up in juvenile detention for assaults while high and drunk. 
when I got taken off mum, I got that survival mode, I just thought like anybody was a threat. And I just like got to a point where, um, you know, like a few people ended up in hospital because of me, because of this rage that I kept inside and that's not who I am. I freaked out, like how much anger I had inside of me. Like I, I didn't know that, it, that, that that could exist in anybody. And it, it took over everything. In early adulthood, she struggled to shake those demons. At that time, I uh, just lost my little sister to uh, suicide. And during the process of me, you know, going to jail, um, my, my daughter was removed from my care. And, um, I just like, uh, at that time, like, I didn't know what grieving felt like. I didn't know everything that I was feeling, it was, un it was normal to feel like that. I didn't know it was normal. Since getting out of jail, Shania has had a second baby girl and dreams of a day when authorities will grant her custody of her eldest daughter. I want to break that cycle because it's horrible that my nan went through it, my mum went through it, I went through it, and now my daughter's going through it. What is your greatest fear right now? Right now, my greatest fear is like, I don't want to go through all of this for nothing. Like, I want to use all of that sadness and use everything, and like, that, that's my motivation to push me even more because, like, I've, I've, I've cried so many nights. Back at Banksia Hill, outreach workers Megan Krakower and Jerry Jordatos say the prison isn't providing enough support for inmates. The reality is at least half of youth detainees re-offend and enter adult prisons. All the programs that are in Banksia at the moment, like any uh, prison, uh, basically recreation and um, some skill sets. But what they don't have on the outside is hope. What they don't have on the outside is support. So all the recreation, the bouncing of basketballs, some minor education and the like, uh, that's not going to change their lives. They're all coming in and out. Their organisation, the National Suicide Prevention and Trauma Recovery Project, is trying to change that with a new program that provides them with housing, jobs or other assistance when they leave prison. We get them to believe in themselves. If you believe in them for long enough, they'll start to believe in themselves. It is not rocket science. People need people. We didn't do anything special. All we did with the young people in prison is treat them like they're our own. If your kid's sick, you want to make them better. You get the medication. If they're hungry, you feed them. If they need to have a yarn, a talk, a conversation because they're not feeling so well, you speak to them. That's where that assertive outreach comes into play, that 24-7. With such high incarceration rates in Western Australia, the demand for their services, both inside and outside the prisons, doesn't stop. I can't tell you the last day that I've worked with a family where incarceration hasn't been the pertinent issue. There's no hope, there's no help, there's no support. And this is so problematic because until there is that psychosocial support, more people are going to die. And that's the reality of what happens in Western Australia. We're a very rich state. We're a very rich state, but we need to be rich for all. Australia's federal and state governments aim to reduce Aboriginal incarceration rates by 15% over the next decade. Western Australia's Attorney General and Aboriginal Affairs Minister declined to be interviewed, but said in a statement that improved prevention strategies would help the state reach this target. But those who've been through the system believe nothing will really change unless public pressure on the government dramatically ramps up. I just want other people out there, like in different countries, to like realise when they come into our country, oh, it's a beautiful country, but there's a lot of damage here. I do have like down days, I have my good days. Um, the damage has been done. 
I've moved on from it, but that pain is still real and it's still there. Like, I just want to be equal like other people out there. I don't think that this pain will ever, ever leave me. Probably will till I leave this earth.